Hi everyone, it's Mike Bird here with another episode of the Nazareth Nicaea podcast and vodcast, the program where we explore all things about the historical Jesus, the Christ of faith, and whatever there is in between. Today we're continuing on with our series in the Christ hymn or the Christ poem of Philippians 2 verses 6 to 11. You know, we've already covered some pretty rigorous terrain. We've looked at the sources, origins, genre of this hymn, or more likely a poem. We've also gone into that peculiar phrase, form of God, and looked at that. And last week, in particular, we explored the meaning of that contested word, harpagmos. You know, does it mean grasping or snatching? And how does that relate to the concept of equality with God? Uh, as we make our way through this, you know, dense and, and richly packed piece of, of Christological material, we're going to now look at what theologians call the kenosis, or what does it mean when Paul says that Christ echinosin, Christ emptied himself. Okay, that's what we're going to explore today. We're going to have a big episode about kenosis, the self-emptying of Christ in the incarnation. But what do we mean by kenosis? Well, according to Paul T Nimmo and Keith Johnson, they say this, the doctrine of kenosis concerns the biblical claim that Christ Jesus emptied and humbled himself in obedience on his way to death upon the cross. So that's how they define the doctrine of kenosis as it seems to be taught in Philippians 2 verse 7. In addition, we're also going to explore some reform debates between the Lutherans and reform theologians about the meaning of kenosis as it applies to the two natures of Christ, his divine and human nature. And that is that is called the extra Calvinisticum, you know, about the communication of divine attributes to the humanity of Jesus and to what extent that is true and, and not true and the like. And I'm going to do that with the help of my uber talented colleague at Ridley College, Scott Harrower. Uh, he's going to talk to us about this extra Calvinisticum and what it means. And that's, that's, that's going to be great. That's going to be fantastic. Uh, and then at the very end, I'm going to ask the question, what is kenosis of chat GPT? We're going to see if this AI bot can do some Christology. And will it be orthodox? Will it be heretical? If you ask a theological question of an AI bot, chat GPT, uh, what kind of answer will it give us? Uh, and I'll, I'll be honest, I was a little bit surprised by it. So that's what we're going to do today. But if exegesis discuss the extra Calvinisticum and then interrogate an AI bot about its own Christology. But first up, let's explore the meaning of Philippians 2 verse 7, where it says that Christ emptied himself or poured himself out. I mean, what does that really mean? And, and, and the meaning, I guess, we get automatically from the translations. The translations are the first interpretive acts when we approach the text. So the Common English Bible puts it like this. It says, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a slave and by becoming like human beings. So you can see that familiar wording, he emptied himself. We can contrast that, however, uh, with the old King James Version, which has something a little bit different. Uh, there it has, but he made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Now, the underlying Greek word you know, behind this you know, emptying, no reputation, it's the Greek word kenoo, which means to empty, to make empty. Now, that, that's what it means literally, but in a more metaphorical sense, it can mean to make something of no repute or no reputation. So you can, you can see the differences there between the Common English Bible and the King James Bible. Uh, the Common English Bible takes, you know, kenao uh, in a literal sense of emptying, while the King James takes it in a more figurative sense of diminishing one's own reputation. Uh, so which one is going on here? You know, ultimately, it, it might be a bit of both in that Christ does move from one state to another, which, you know, can be understood as a literal emptying, but in doing so, he does attain 
a lower or lesser position. So he does kind of diminish his own reputation. So you could say that what is envisaged is both a divestment and a deprivation. And that means he's going from divine glory and authority to humanity and slavery. We should note too that this emptying occurs in direct and stark contrast to Jesus being in the form of God and being equal to God. That, that's what the contrast is with, you know, Paul says, you know, Allah, but he emptied himself. You know, he was in that state of possessing the form of God and equality with God. That's, that's what I've argued in, in previous episodes. But despite all that, he has decided to empty himself. And despite being so divine, uh, despite possessing this superlative status of being in the form of God and equal to God, he set it all aside and made himself lower in nature and position by becoming human and not just human, even taking upon himself the role of a slave. And that, I think, answers the question, what did Jesus empty himself of? You know, what does Jesus lay aside or give up? I mean, historically, there's been a lot of answers to those questions. Some have said Jesus empties himself off uh, or divests himself of the form and glory of God. Others say, well, you know what he, uh, I mean, he maintains his divinity, but what he leaves behind is his independent use of divine prerogatives. And others say, no, what he leaves behind are all the omnis. He, he leaves behind his omnipotence, his omniscience, you know, and, and all those sort of things. All the sort of, you know, the real uh, divine powers you associate with the omnis like that. I mean, I mean, people have proposed them throughout, you know, last 2000 years or so. But generally, I, I think they're, you know, missing the point. Um, the emptying or divesting is not about anything that Jesus leaves behind on heaven. It's not like a, it's not like a superpower um, that he's kind of, you know, putting aside as if he's got like, you know, a magic cape like Doctor Strange or it's like his utility belt if it's, as if he was Batman or something. Uh, rather, the emptying is not what he leaves behind in heaven. It's what he adds to himself. I think, I think it's self-emptying. It's divestment by addition. And I think that makes sense if you read the, the rest of verses 7 to 8. You know, this is what it says, but he emptied himself, and note this, by taking the form of a slave, by becoming like human beings. He humbled himself be by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Now, uh, you've got to remember in that translation, the word by is not in the original Greek. That's something we add to try and make sense of the uh, of the Greek, the grammar in, in our own English translation. But we have some participles there related to taking and becoming. And I think those participles function in such a way as to imply the mode by which this self-emptying or this self-lowering or even the self-deprecation takes place. And I would add as well that the emptying seems to be parallel to the humbling. So the, the, the emptying happens by means of adopting this humble position as a human being, as one who is in a position of servitude and even, even dying a slave's death. And this generally was the patristic understanding of this passage. Certainly Athanasius was pushing this line. Kenosis, not so much leaving behind stuff like the omnis or divine prerogatives, but it's kenosis by the addition of humanity and service to his very own person. Uh, Cyril of Alexander, I've just been, I've just been reading uh, his book on the unity of Christ, and he says this. Uh, he asks, and what is this emptying out? It is his life in the form of a slave, in the flesh which he assumes. It is the likeness to us of one who is not as we are in his own nature, since he is above all creation. In this way, he humbled himself economically, submitting himself to the limitation of manhood. I think Cyril there gives a pretty good uh, summary of the general patristic understanding of the meaning of kenosis. It's not really leaving behind any attribute, aspects of his divine nature. It's the addition of manhood, the taking on of this task of messianic redemption and human, human suffering. That seems to be the main thing uh, that interpreters, at least in the early centuries, 
thought was meant by the kenosis of Christ. But obviously that's not where the debate ends and there is a long history of interpretation and there's a lot of disagreements over the meaning of kenosis. And we can see that in the medieval period, in the reform period, and even among Protestant scholastics, indeed, all the way into the present. So let's chat to my good friend, Scott Harrower, and see what he has to say about uh, the meaning of kenosis in historical theology. And, and that's going to be a great chat. So don't go anywhere. That's coming up right now. Well, continuing on with our discussions of kenosis, I'm joined by my excellent colleague, Dr. Scott Harrower, uh, who covers many good things in his teaching, ranging from Trinity, trauma, and of course, kenosis. Because if you're doing theology, you've got to have Christology. And wherever you're doing Christology, you've got to kind of wrestle with the kenosis tradition. And, and that, that became a distinct tradition in the medieval context. But it, it also became a bit of a bit of a sticking point during the Reformation. And it's where the, uh, the Continental Reformed and the Lutherans, you know, they, um, they caught some beef with each other on this, over this thing called the Extra Calvinisticum. I mean, I've got, I've got, I'd say I've got like uh, sufficienter Calvinisticum in my life. I didn't know I need extra. Is this kind of like, you know, Calvin Plus or yes, Calvin Premium? What's, yes, this, what's this? What's this extra Calvinism I'm missing out on, Scott? What's the extra Calvinist, Calvinisticum, and what does it have to do with kenosis? Okay, so the extra Calvinisticum is a term that Lutherans threw at Calvinists by saying they have this extra bit of theology. However, if we want to be more sort of theologically sensible and pastoral about it, the extra Calvinisticum just refers to the fact that God's the son, the son's divine nature and works, they're not confined by his human nature. So all the extra Calvinisticum makes explicit is the fact that um, what Hebrews says is that even though God the son is incarnate, he continues to uphold the whole universe by his divine nature. So the extra Calvinisticum is a very biblical doctrine it was held by athanasius and augustine mainly used in praise actually praising the great logos who continues to rule all things and all things are upheld by him yet at the same time he's the one who took on a human nature and comes alongside us um so look here's a good biblical verse we can read um that is sort of the biblical basis for the extra calvinisticum here we go hebrews 1 1 to 3 um, here it argues for an ongoing divine powers of God the Son, even though he's incarnate and located in one place, which will become relevant later. So Hebrews 1, 1 to 3 says, In the past God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many different times and in various ways, but in these last days he's spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed as heir of all things, and through him he has made the universe. The sun is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he'd provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the Father in the majesty in heaven. And so there you have it, Mike. You've got Jesus Christ, divine, sustaining all things by his powerful word, incarnate, and sitting down at the right hand of the Father. They're the three things that become big debates in the Reformation era. Where is Jesus' body? Yeah. Right hand of the Father. Is he human? Yes. Is he divine? Yes. Does he still exercise divine powers and operations, even though he is divine? I'm human. Yes, he does. So does this mean the incarnation was not like undercover boss, where he's like putting someone else in charge as the company, while he goes incognito to work amongst all the plebs on the factory floor, the extra Calvinist is saying, no, all that CEO of the galaxy stuff is still happening, even though he's incarnate. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So he is the emperor in Star Wars who, like, you might mistake for an old man in a scraggly cloak, but actually he's running everything at the same time. Oh, okay. J just a much nicer version, less wrinkles. Less wrinkles. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, what, what were the Lutherans trying to protect or guard? 
because obviously, you know, the, the Lutherans and and the Calvinists had a few differences ranging from, you know, um, extent of the atonement through to the, you know, presence in the Lord's Supper. So what's some of the things that the, what were, what the Lutherans trying to guard in their rejection of the extra Calvinisticum? Well, I think first we need to think about Chalcedon, Council of Chalcedon. Both the Lutherans and the Reformed, who had a conflict over the extent of Jesus' presence in the world, his is his human nature present everywhere because there's a union between his human nature and his divine nature. So they, they clashed over that. Um, they clashed over how Jesus could be present in the Lord's Supper. Um, they clashed over exactly where his body was. Um, what they're both trying to defend is Chalcedonian Christology. So both of them want to defend the particulars of the following statement, right? This is from Chalcedon. Chalcedon says that there's one and the same Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son, who must be confessed in two natures, unconfusedly, immutably, indivisibly, inseparably, and without the distinction of natures being taken away by such a union. So both the Lutherans and the Reformed are wanting to say, you've got one person, two natures. You can't confuse them. He's not a third thing. He's not a human divine hybrid. Mm. But you can't divide them. You can't separate them or distinguish them too harshly. So both sides were trying to say, when you speak about Jesus, you need to acknowledge his human nature and his divine nature. So how this all kicked off in the Reformation period was there was this guy Zwingli who is a bit of a hothead, to be honest, and he sort of dies in battle. He's this Swiss bloke who becomes a Christian and he wants to say, look, we need to protect Christians against idolatry. That's his big driver. So he's rejecting the saints, he's rejecting parades of Mary, all this kind of stuff. And he's wanting to reject transubstantiation in communion. He's wanting to say the bread and the wine are, are just that. They're just signs. They're reminders, okay, for this moment where you remember the atoning death of Jesus. So <clears throat> he says there's no way that these can actually be the body and the blood of Jesus. It, it can't be the case. Luther met with Zwingli in 1529 to try to come together politically and theologically to say, you know what, says Luther, Jesus can be sort of, his human nature can be in, with, and under, sort of around the elements of the Eucharist. So we have a meaningful view of the Eucharist, like the body and the blood are significant, but I'm not saying they turn into blood and bread, but I'm saying Jesus is all around it. Why? Well, Jesus is everywhere. His human nature is united with his divine nature. And because his divine nature is everywhere, well, he must be around the elements of communion meaningfully, right? So you've got the omnipresence of his humanity. Yes. Yeah, so it's called the Lutheran ubiquity, just as... God's divine nature is ubiquitous. He's everywhere in a sense, present in different ways. So is his human nature because of the hypostatic union. Um, Zwingli is like, no way. You, you can't have that. But for Luther, if you're saying that there's a unity between the two natures and one nature can be everywhere, yet the other one can't, what you're doing is you're splitting apart that Chalcedonian conviction that the natures are united to one another. Zwingli, though, wants to say, hey, listen, Jesus is in one place. He's seated at the right hand of the Father right now. He is not everywhere. So yeah. the, the Lutherans and the Reformed go in their separate ways, but they're both wanting to uphold Chalcedonian Christology. And it's a very important pastoral issue because most of us want to think about how is Jesus present to us today. Mike, I reckon the best thing about the Reformed is that they were very strong on Jesus being prophet, priest, and king. Yep, the, the triplex munis. Yep. The triplex office. munis. That gets you out of heaps of theological confusion. 
You don't need to argue for a Lutheran version of Jesus' human nature being everywhere in order to speak about Jesus being present to us. If you look at the book of Acts, how is Jesus present to his people? He sends his spirit. Jesus continues to minister to us individually and as local groups and the church generally through his spirit as he continues to minister as prophet, priest, king. So I think a, a Lutheran view of Jesus' ubiquity ends up collapsing the natures into one another. And because you've taken over theological space with this ubiquity of Christ, it means you don't allow enough oxygen in the room to think about how Jesus rules and continues to minister within the body as prophet, priest, and king. So it comes at a big price. Yeah, I can see. I can see how that would be a big problem. I mean, I've, I've often heard it said that the the Lutherans tend to move. I mean, in their understanding of Chalcedon, which is about the two natures um, united but unmixed and unconfused in one person, the Lutherans yeah. do come a little bit close to Eutychianism, which is kind of blending them together a bit too much. And the Reformed have the opposite. They tend to be a little bit m more Nestorian. Yeah, and they divide it because Calvin says our union with Christ is only human with only union with His human nature, not mm. with His divine nature. Yeah, and that's yeah. I've always thought that funny because a lot of people try to read Calvin as if he's a conduit for theosis. I I do not I do not think Calvin's doctrine of union with Christ really takes you into a a theotic um, idea because he does have he he does he, he he's very much our participation in Christ as participation in his humanity which is hypostatically united to his divinity but it's it's not one and it's not one on the same it's not a pure kind of you know medieval byzantine view of of union so i would do you think that's right that that one's a little bit more eutychian one's a little bit more nestorian yeah they can lean that way you can lean that way um however i think fundamentally and richard cross has brought this out in his recent 2022 and 2019 volumes is that it really comes down to what you think the incarnation is is the incarnation the second person of the trinity taking on a human nature um whether you begin your um, discussion of um, the relationship between the natures by thinking about the second person of the trinity assuming a human nature which puts bounds on that relationship in the first place or do you just think of two natures in one person if you think of two natures in one person in an abstract sense without really thinking about the second person of the trinity being the one who enlivens and activates that human nature that he takes on then you're more likely to blend them into one another mm. so i think the model of the incarnation that you have in the first place is really, really important and is determinative for where you'll go. So in my mind, like, sorry. Yeah. Did you want so to what you think of the, of the, the incarnation and that version of kenosis there will then determine how you think the two natures relate to each other. Yes. Yeah. So, um, what, what's called a suppositorial union, this is Cross's language emphasizes a union that's based on the second person of the trinity taking on that human nature and that is in my mind and and like in the mind of most historians dealing with trinitarian christological history that is the n hypostatic and an hypostatic model that is healthiest to capture the biblical witness to jesus as the logos in whom all things are made, yet he takes on a human nature, yet he continues his operations as fully divine without restraint due to that human nature. So I, I think that that's really important uh, for people to know. So if people want to chase it up, I'd look at the book by Richard Cross, Communicatio Idiomatum, Reformed Christological Debates. That's a 2019 one. It's an excellent book, as is his 2022 Christology and Metaphysics, because what Cross is awesome at doing is he's really good at mapping out what people are claiming to do with Christology and how they're relating to concepts that have gone before them. So for anyone working in Christology, especially this area, 
communicatio idiomatum, um, I would urge you to go to Cross's work because really it's about how you understand the incarnation in the first place, how you understand the relationships between the natures is then going to fuel everything you say about Jesus' ongoing ministry today in pastoral care, in churches, through means uh, like communion and baptism and preaching. Um, so, so to have a robust understanding even of the economic trinity, you, you really need to be clear in this area. Okay. Well, that makes a lot of sense, Scott. Well, a lot of technical language there. What was that yeah. term? Suppository? <laughs> Suppositor union. Suppositor union. I'll be honest with you, my, when you said that, wor that word, my bowels did clench. My bowels did, I'm sorry to hear my about bowels that. did clench when you <laughs> referred to suppositor union. Uh, but no there worries, the point of the suppositor union is that it's the divine person who is the foundation of the life of Jesus Christ. Well, that's that's good to hear. That's good. <laughs> yeah. you know, theology. It's about hygienic theology, and maybe with a suppositor union, we've got a bit more hygienic. Maybe, maybe. So, but suppositor union. I'm um, yeah. I'm happy for Jesus to be the one who experiences that rather than than myself. But there we go. There we go. Well, Scott, it is great <laughs> to talk. It is oh, great dear. to talk to you again, my friend. <laughs> and uh, yes, so okay, hopefully everyone. Well, I hope you've enjoyed your last. Your last theological um, episode ever. <laughs> Before getting, I don't know. Maybe, maybe we'll get sponsored. You know, you know, from um, <laughs> pharmaceutical companies. It's like you know, you know people oh looking God. for suppositories or something. Um, we'll, does we'll it see always that. have to end this way? <laughs> it doesn't have to end this way, but it just does. That's okay. <laughs> that's that's life. That's life. Very great, great, great talking to you, Scott. Thanks yeah. a lot, man. All right. See you, mate. Bye. Well, there you have it, some interesting stuff on kenosis uh, from Scott Howrah, particularly looking at how this issue played out in debates between uh, Lutherans and the European Reformed churches. And, th and there were a few differences, as Scott pointed out, because how you think of the kenosis or the incarnation uh, does determine what you think about how the two natures of Christ related to each other. Uh, but before we finish off, I thought I would just do one final exercise for you. And I put the question, what is kenosis, into ChatGPT. For those who don't know, ChatGPT is an AI software, kind of like a uh, an artificial intelligence search engine, uh, which can do a bit of theology for you. It can even You can even write sermons and that sort of a thing. So I put the question into... Uh, chat GPT and this is what it came up with. Now if you look at the screen there you can see it starts off in the first paragraph pretty easy it says kenosis is a term that comes from the Greek word kenosis which means emptying. In Christian theology it refers to the voluntary self-emptying or self-renunciation of Christ as described in the biblical passage of Philippians 2 7. The passage says that Jesus, who is equal to God, emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in human likeness. Okay, pretty simple and straightforward. Uh, then it says the concept of kenosis is often used to describe the humility of Jesus, who, and note this, gave up his divine privileges and became a human being subject to suffering and death. Now, that bit is a little bit more controversial because remember, in the definition of kenosis I gave, uh, the kenosis is not so much what he gives up, but rather what it takes on. So it seems ChatGPT could uh, use a few years in seminary uh, to brush up on a few things. Although, you know, some people would define kenosis that way. Uh, but then adds the, eth the ethical aspect. The idea is that Christ's self-emptying was an act of love and sacrifice, demonstrating his obedience to God and his concern for humanity. Kenosis is considered an essential part of the doctrine of the Incarnation, which teaches that God became fully human in Jesus Christ. And then it shows how this can maybe apply to uh, Christians in general. The term kenosis can be used more broadly to describe the idea of self-emptying or self-giving as a spiritual practice. 
In this sense, it refers to the intentional letting go of one's ego or self-centeredness in order to become more open and receptive to the divine presence. It is seen as a way to cultivate humility, compassion, and love for others following the example of Christ. Uh, well, apart from, you know, being receptive to the divine presence, um, I would say that's, that's a fairly reasonable inference as to what uh, the Philippian Christ hymn or Christ poem is about. Uh, it does proclaim who Christ is, but it also has a strong ethical imperative. It creates a paradigm that Christians are meant to emulate. That is to follow the example of Christ in his own self-emptying. Christ did not lay hold of his honor and privileges because, you know, Paul gives up his Jewish privileges to become a servant of Christ. Uh, Paul wants the Philippians to give up their privileges of Roman citizenship so they can too serve Christ. But that's all rooted in the example of Christ himself. So, yeah, an interesting, uh, interesting angle from ChatGPT over what the kenosis is really about. I think that'll do us for it today. Uh, next time, we'll, we'll get into a little bit more of the Philippian Christ poem. I think we'll move into the second half of the poem and we'll look at the exaltation of Christ. Uh, does this mean that Jesus is a subordinate figure since he's the one who is exalted by God. So is Jesus a lower divine being exalted by a high God? We'll have a brief discussion of those aspects and that will probably close out our discussion of the Christology of the Christ hymn or the Christ poem. Uh, until then, take care, enjoy the channel. And yeah, if you can do me a favor, uh, please like, share, subscribe, or even listen to the podcast version on somewhere like Spotify or Apple podcasts. Otherwise, I'll see you around the channel.